the Medical School HQ Podcast, Session 28. Hello and welcome back to another session of the Medical School HQ Podcast, the podcast about medical school where we take you through the pre-med process, medical school, and even through residency. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Gray, and I'm here to take your knowledge of becoming a physician to the next level. And to the next level, we are going to take you today. We have Dr. Mike McKinnis with us today. He's one of the chief educators over at Doctors in Training, which you can find at doctorsintraining.com. They're a small company that works in test prep, and more specifically in the USMLE Step one and step two, as well as the complex levels, and they help prepare medical students past the boards. And today I brought him on to talk specifically about the USMLE boards and how important those are on your path into whatever residency that you want to do and some strategies to employ while you're studying. And he talks, he talks about what doctors in training can do to help you with your studying. For this episode, we don't talk about Comlex. I'll have uh, another podcast dedicated to the Comlex levels, so you osteopathic students out there, don't fret. I'm not ignoring you. I'll get to you. Um, But Dr. Mike McGinnis today talks about USMLE boards, and we start off by talking about his path to becoming a physician. I am uh, an internist by training. I did my, uh, my undergraduate at uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And then I went to medical school at uh, uh, UT Health Science Center in Houston. Uh, and then I did uh, residency training in Dallas uh, in internal medicine. And then I, I practiced for about seven years. And now I'm uh, with doctors in training. And uh, you know my, my role as, as director of production is uh, primarily both teaching and overseeing the department and the development of, of curriculum and development of lectures and, and all the all the different products that we offer. So I've got my finger in a, a lot of uh, different uh, pies over here, so to speak. Okay, and I brought you on today. I, I wanted you to, to be on today to talk about board exams. And this is something I was reading on Student Doctor Network uh, that I peruse sometimes just to see the the latest in in the flame wars, but I wanted to it, what I what I saw on Student Doctor Network there was a comment. I think the 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 overall title of the forum was something about the the silliest thing that you saw during your interviews or the stupidest thing somebody said during your interviews, and and there was a comment that somebody was making fun of another a student that was interviewing because he didn't know what the board exams were. He he hadn't looked that far forward to know that in medical school and in beyond there's there's what's called the the USMLE boards for allopathic MD students and for the osteopathic students the the complex uh levels and and so I wanted to kind of have you on since you teach this stuff and talk about what exactly the boards are, why they're important, and and kind of different routes of studying and, and what's on them. So kind of generically, can you explain to, to the students out there that maybe don't understand fully yet the the extra tests? We, as, as students, pre-med students out there, they go, oh, okay, I'm done with the MCAT. Now I just have school, and I'll, I'll graduate, and I'll be a doctor. And then they don't realize that there's more and more tests beyond the MCAT. Can you explain a little bit about what the, the USMLE boards are? Sure. Um, and I certainly understand that about, you think, you, you think I've, I've got my last test and that they never end. They never, ever end. Um, the, the, the USMLE or the U.S. United States Medical Licensing Exam is, is basically a, a three, or depending on how you want to count it, a four-part test uh, that is designed to test whether or not a medical student, a, a graduating medical student, is um, knowledgeable enough to be licensed as a physician. It's the licensing exam. It's what you have to take in order to get your medical license. 
Um, now that's separate from specializing and doing your your residency training, um, and I won't go into all that unless you really want to hear about it. But you know, like I said, there's there's three or or perhaps you could count it as four parts, uh, and they're called the USMLE Step One, Step Two, and Step Three. The Step One exam is usually taken at the end of the second year of medical school, so sort of halfway through. And in most medical school uh, curricula, you do the first two years, you do basic sciences like gross anatomy, biochemistry, pathology, pharmacology, um, and that time is mostly spent in the classroom. And at the end of that two years, you take the part one, or the step one, rather, uh, USMLE step one. And that is uh, a, a really long test, uh, a computerized multiple choice test uh, that you have to go to special testing centers and sit down and, and take this exhaustive, long multiple choice test. And it's basically testing you on how well have you learned all that basic science stuff. Um, and frankly, a lot of it is stuff that um, medical students only learn because they know it's going to be tested on this exam. They know full well it's not necessarily super clinically useful. Um, they're testing on diseases that you think, gosh, I'm never going to see this. Well, that's probably true, but it's important to learn because it's going to be on this test. And the the important thing, I think one of the most important things about the Step 1 test, the USMLE Step 1, is that you it's a very high stakes test, meaning that the the um, residency programs use your score on step one to determine whether or not they're going to extend the offer to come interview for a residency position. Uh, they often use those test uh, scores in, res in, in determining whether or not they want to uh, rank you to, to match with their residency program. Um, and I recognize that, you know, certainly that's a lot of foreign language to a lot of um, pre-medical students who haven't looked that far down the road. But basically, if you do very well on USMLE Step 1, you have a much better chance of getting into the kind of residency that you want to get into so that you can specialize in uh, cardiothoracic surgery or neurosurgery or uh, ENT or radiology or whatever you want to specialize in. Some of those specialties are very, very selective. They're very hard to get into. Uh, they're very desirable right now. And, you know, they have many, many, many more applicants than, than residency positions. So the residency programs are in the nice position of saying, well, we are going to be very selective and, and say, well, we're only going to even offer an interview to students who score above, say, a 235 or 240, uh, which is a, a reasonably high score uh, on, on USMLE Step 1. Um, you know, the scoring... I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but I believe uh, an average score is around a 220, and a good score is probably in the 235 to 245 range, and a super terrific score is like a 260. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, students who want to, you know, really get into one of those difficult residency, you know, those, those residencies that are very selective, they're difficult to get into, they need to do very well on, on step one exam. So you take your step one exam. Wait, uh, I, I, let me let me stop sure. you there for a second. Sure. So for, and and you you kind of mentioned it that pre med students might not understand the whole match and residency, but what what they do understand right now is the MCAT, and they understand that hopefully that the MCAT is one of those big roadblocks to getting into. Number one, getting into medical school, but number two, getting into one of the so-called top medical school programs out there that they want to go to. And it, I think it would be fair, and, and you can agree or disagree, it, I think it would be fair to compare step one to the MCAT. You want to do as well as you can to to get those offers to... For the MCAT to re to medical school, but for the USMLE Step One to get the offers into the top residency programs that you want to get into, so it's that same s similar kind of gatekeeper. Exactly, 
Yeah, I mean, having just just like having a an average MCAT score may not keep you out of medical school. Having a great MCAT score is going to give you more opportunities. It's going to keep the doors open. And this, by the same, in the exact same way, having a great step one score is going to keep more options open to you. Having a, a an average step one score is going to close some doors. Uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are some people who get into. You know, imagine I'm, I'm going to throw out something and say that um, interventional radiology, and I'm pulling that out of thin air. Well, let's say let's say dermatology. Dermatology is one of those residencies that's difficult to get into. Lots of students want to go into dermatology for one reason or another. Um, and if you have uh, uh, an average uh, step one score, you can possibly still get into a dermatology residency, but it's going to be a lot more difficult. And having a great step one score keeps the doors open. You know, and if you, there actually, you can go find data on, uh, you know, the average score, uh, average step one score for students who matched into those different residency programs. And you can see that, you know, if you sort of plot them out, on, on one end of the spectrum you have the very selective residency programs like diagnostic radiology and ophthalmology and dermatology and some of those others that have, you know, the average score, the, the, the students who match into those programs on average have USMLE Step 1 scores in the, in the 240s. And then you go down to the other end of the spectrum and you have and this is not to belittle these residency programs or these specialties at all, but you have things like, uh, you know, internal medicine uh, and, and pediatrics and psychiatry and family medicine are on the lower end of the, the scale where the average score is going to be a lot lower down around 220, I, I believe. Uh, and those numbers vary from year to year, but that's, you know, again, it's the same kind of thing. The MCAT, uh, you know, opens doors. If you have a great MCAT score, you have a lot more options open to you uh, in, in terms of what medical schools you're likely to get into, and the, the same thing holds true for step one scores with residencies. Okay, good. I, th I think that'll help kind of clear it up a little bit better for, sure. for students that might not know. Sure. So the step one you mentioned is taken typically at the end of the second year of medical school. Now, are are they testing your knowledge of patients? Are they testing more book knowledge? How are they integrating patients? How are they asking questions on step one? Yeah, it's it's really kind of interesting um, because, and I don't know exactly when this happened, but for a long time, the questions were very book knowledge-y. It was not a lot of being able to uh, recognize diseases based on their their clinical history or their physical examination findings and that sort of thing. And what they determined was, well, gosh, we're not testing what doctors are really going to be able to do in the real world. So we want to make this, we want to make the step one test much more clinical. And so they started saying that even if we're going to ask you about some esoteric biochemistry pathway, um, we're going to frame the question in a way that that is somewhat clinical so that, it, you know, it's going to start with, a 35-year-old white male comes into your clinic with the following symptoms and you examine him and he's got these following physical findings. And so you as a student have to be able to take that information and say, aha, they're talking about such and such disease. And then the question might be, without giving you what the diagnosis is, they might say, what uh, is the, the, the enzyme that's deficient in this disease? Or they might say, what treatment would be most likely to to benefit this patient. So they're, they're going to make you read the, the clinical information then in your mind, make a diagnosis, and then from that figure out, you know, what the enzyme deficiency is, and, and, and from that figure out, okay, what am I going to treat this patient with? So it is, um, it is somewhat clinical. It is somewhat patient-based, and, and a lot of the questions have gone that way, and they try to get away from questions that don't have any clinical basis at all. Um, but at the same time, they certainly recognize that, uh, you know, these are this test is being taken by students who have not seen a lot of patients, in, in a lot of schools have not seen any patients really, and don't have a lot of that clinical knowledge. So, it's it's very much a basic science test, um, but they do expect you to have have some 
some clinical understanding because they, they recognize that that's what most students are are excited about is seeing patients. They're you know eager to get in into the into the hospitals into the clinics and see patients, and so that's that's the way it's being tested more and more. Um, but that's still you know, they're still really testing how much of the basic science do you know? Do you know the anatomy? Do you know the biochemistry? Um, do you know the histology? You know, they might give you uh, a, a, a presentation of a patient with a very specific um, set of, of s- symptoms and complaints and very specific physical examination findings, and then they ask you, you know, what is most likely to show up on the biopsy? So they're testing your knowledge of Histology. They're going to ask you for, you know, to to be able to recognize what the 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 microscopic findings are when you look at the the tissue under a microscope. Or they might give you the clinical presentation and then give you the histological findings uh, and ask you to uh, know that diagnosis, be able to recognize that diagnosis, not just from the the clinical presentation, but also from you know, the histology. So it, it can be uh, very tricky to students because they, they haven't seen a lot of patients, you know. Uh, most, yeah. most medical schools, you know, you don't see any patients. Maybe you get a, a little bit of, of exposure to sort of taking a history from a, a patient in your, in your first and second year of school, but most students don't have really any clinical experience at all. So it can be very, uh, very frustrating. And, and as a result, you know, most medical schools have gone toward testing students and teaching, uh, you know, this, this material in a clinical way, you know, whether it be through, um, you know, sort of organ systems based where, where we're going to teach you, you know, for two months, you're going to do nothing but study the cardiovascular system, and you're going to study the anatomy of the cardiovascular system, and you're going to study the histology and the pathology and all these different disease processes so that you are prepared for that test. And I I don't know um, if it's a matter of uh, the dog wagging the tail or the tail wagging the dog, but there's definitely, you know, schools are teaching it this way and the and the test is, is testing it that way. Yeah, and I think the overall goal, hopefully, and I say this all the time, the, the end goal is always better patient care. And I think that the earlier that we can get students thinking in a way that lets them integrate all the knowledge that they have is going to be better for patient care down the line. And and it's interesting, you mentioned you don't really un- know when these changes to step one occurred because when I took step one, I I remember it being, and I, I took it in 2007, I remember it being more of just a, a kind of a fact and knowledge-based test, more of that book knowledge, whereas step two, which we'll talk about in a little bit, was more of that integration of here's a patient and you probably know what the diagnosis is based on the presentation, but we're not asking you what the diagnosis is. We're asking you a couple steps down the line, what's the treatment or what's the, the how do you diagnose the diagnosis, uh, those kind of questions. So it sounds like step one is going more in that direction as well. It is. I mean, it, 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 the, the lines do get blurred a lot. And even they've, they've announced that in, in the coming uh, versions of these tests, they're going to be asking even some of those basic science questions more and more in step two and step three. So, you know, like I said, the lines are getting blurrier and blurrier, and it's getting more important to, you know, for students to continue to have some memory of all that basic science stuff uh, later in their training and, and earlier in their training for students to, to have some understanding of the clinical as well. Okay. So that's that's step one. Are, are there any other big points to talk about with step one? I don't think so. Okay. So let's talk about so, step two. Yeah. So step two is where we get into this. This Is it three parts or is it four parts? Because there's actually two parts of the step two exam and two separate scores. There's the, the step two CK or, or step two clinical knowledge, uh, which is very much like step one in that it's a, a, a computer-based multiple choice test. Um, and as you mentioned, it's it's more clinical. It's moving away from the basic science and book knowledge and moving more toward actual patient care. Um, and it's it's about the same length as, as the step one exam in terms of number of questions, that sort of thing. But instead of asking you to 
you know, recognize the, the histology or remember what the biochemistry is, you know, the, the step 2CK exam is typically asking you to uh, know how you're going to make a diagnosis, what are the diagnostic tests you're going to order for a patient based on their, uh, you know, their, their physical exam findings or based on your, your history and, and based on some of the clinical data that you get. Um, and and uh, the way I like to think about it is, you know, they, they recognize that a, uh, a, a third-year student, and, and let me get back up and say that most students take uh, the Step 2 CK exam after their third year, um, you know, early in their fourth year, maybe the tail end of their third year. Most students seem to take it earlier in their fourth year. And so they've spent that third year of medical school in the hospital doing uh, rotations or doing clerkships uh, where you are doing internal medicine and you're seeing patients with uh, heart disease and gastroenterological diseases and, and liver disease and, and all sorts of things. Or, or you're doing a pediatric rotation and so you're seeing, uh, you know, kids either in the hospital or in, or in the clinic. Uh, you're doing a surgical rotation, so you're, you're sitting in on surgery and you're evaluating surgical patients and learning about how to take care of patients uh, post-operatively after they've had surgery. Uh, you're, you know, you're doing uh, an OBGYN rotation and you're um, observing hysterectomies and you're helping deliver babies and all those kinds of things. So, you know, you've spent that third year doing a lot of the clinical stuff, seeing a lot of stuff. You spend a ton of time third year taking, you know, sitting down and interviewing patients and taking their history and physical exam and, and figuring out what's normal and what's not normal and ordering labs and following up on lab results and deciding with your team, with your residents, what am I going to order next? What's our next step to, to make a diagnosis in this patient? Um, and so the step 2CK exam is designed to test how well has a student learned to be able to do that? How well can a student um, sort of get some history and come up with a good diagnosis and then not just know the diagnosis but know what's the next step? What do we need to do to rule out something dangerous? This patient comes in with chest pain and you think based on the history they've got uh, they're having a heart attack. Well, what are your next tests going to be? Or you think it's not a heart attack. You think they've just got heartburn. Well, what test do you need to do to rule out the bad stuff and to figure out that what they really have is, is just heartburn? So it's a lot of questions on how do you make the diagnostic, diagnosis? What's the next diagnostic test? What are the expected lab findings? If you did this diagnostic test, what are you going to be looking for? What are you expecting to see? And then very often there are questions about, you know, the beginnings of treatment. Uh, you know, how well, you know, do you know what's the most important thing first step for treating this patient. Not all the details. I mean, they're not going to ask you, you know, what dose of this drug is, is right, uh, you know, but they are, they do ask things like, uh, you know, what class of drug is, is, is appropriate for this patient at this point? Um, you know, is this patient, does this patient need medication? Do they need what we call medical therapy? Do they need to be taking medicine for this? Or do they need surgery for this? Or do they need more diagnostic tests? So, uh, you know, you get a little bit of treatment, you get the beginnings of treatment, but again, they're testing whether or not a student is able to function at a, at a level appropriate for a senior level medical student. Are they able to take care of patients uh, with some supervision? So that's sort of the step two CK exam. And then there's another part of the test, this, the step two CS exam, which I believe is clinical skills. Um, and, and, and this is a part of the test that was, uh, that came along after I was already through medical school. And so I didn't ever take the CS exam. Um, did you? You probably yeah, know more I, about it than I did. <laughs> yeah, I I took step two CS and I can I can briefly talk about it, but it's it's the clinical skills part. So most most medical schools now will prepare you for this, and they have a, a, what they call it an OSCE, um, uh -huh. where where they will set you up with mock patients, and that's what clinical skills is. Is they they have actors that that are paid and Clinical skills is kind of an expensive test because you have to pay for it, number one, but then you typically will have to fly to one of the, I think they're up to five or six testing locations throughout the country where they, they test, and it's a day of going and, and seeing patients and doing histories and doing physicals and writing a note, and you, you need to be able to 
to ask all the right questions based on the answers that the patient's giving you. You need to do a proper physical exam based on what kind of differential diagnosis that you're building in your mind. And then you need to write a a somewhat uh, knowledgeable note that that integrates it all with a good assessment and plan and and how you're going to move forward. And I, I think you see, I've, I, I don't know how many patients you see, I forget, I'll have to look it up, but I'll, I'll put that in the show notes afterwards. But it's, it's more like real life doctoring. You, you go and you put hands on a patient and it's, it's fun. And, 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 and I always thought that, you know, seeing, doing those, those OSCEs, we did have OSCEs when I was in school, we just didn't have the CS exam. But, um, you know, I always thought that that was exciting and that was fun because that's, that's what you want to do as a medical school. I want to get in there and I want to see patients and talk to people and examine them and, and come up with a plan. And I, I think what happens is a lot of students get very nervous about it because it's so different from any other test they've ever taken. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a test where you are interacting with a real life human being. And granted, it's an actor rather than an actual sick person, but uh, you know it's 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 very different. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of performance anxiety. I think uh, students, even though they've done OSCEs at their own school, they just don't feel as comfortable. Even though they've been doing, you know, almost nothing but you know, take histories and examine patients as a medical student for the for their entire third year, uh, you know, they they feel very unnerved and very scared by this this part of the exam. Uh, you know, as opposed to Multiple choice tests. I've done multiple choice tests since I was in sixth grade. I, I can do a multiple choice test. So I think that's part of what students get flustered yeah. about. And, yeah, and well, you know, the, the test is talking back to you. It's the first right. time you've ever had a test talk back to you. <laughs> that's a good point. And, and I believe now, and I don't know if this was the case when you took the exam, but I believe now uh, students are required, as you said, to write their, their note, sort of to outline the history that they, they gathered from the, the patient and outline the uh, you know what they found on physical exam and then outline you know their their clinical impression what do I think this patient has and what what their plan is going to be and that has to be Ned now electronically and again um, that's something that students should be very comfortable with uh, but for a lot of students especially um, foreign medical graduates or international medical graduates uh, who are coming into the US and, and taking this exam so that they can get into a US medical uh, you know, residency, um, you know, that, that has, from what I've heard from students, that has been very, very frightening, you know, because for whatever reason, um, you know, when I was doing it on, on paper with pen, that was, that was okay, but now I have to actually put it, put it on, you know, type it and do it electronically, and there's time limits involved, and students are concerned they're not going to be able to, to type fast enough, and I, I never understood that. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine a student these days who is not as comfortable with an electronic medium as they, as they, if not more comfortable than they would be with pencil and paper. But I still hear that from students who, you know, especially the, the international medical graduates who are, who are concerned about their ability to get it all done. And that could be potentially some of the language barrier. I don't know. Yeah, and that's, that's something I haven't covered a lot yet, but I, I do intend to uh, on the podcast and on the website that the international medical graduates both uh, U.S. citizens and uh, non-U.S. citizens right. that that are coming as with English as a second language. That step two CS could be a, a big barrier for them. Yeah. Uh, so that's okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say that's that's I think step two in a nutshell. Now, is is step two important for residency? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's this sense amongst medical students. Uh, that, well, step one is everything. If you get a great step one score, you don't really care what step two is. And again, when you look at the statistics and they, and they, uh, they survey the residency program directors every year and, and they get this information back about what, uh, you know, what factors are you looking for? How do you determine who you're going to interview? How do you determine who you're going to, um, who you're going to offer a residency position to, um, you know, Step one is definitely up there, especially in terms of getting the offer to come do an interview. But the step two score is also considered in a lot of resident. I don't have the numbers uh, at the, you know, at my fingertips, but a lot of residency directors will say, uh, you know, step two score. I, I won't 
offer an interview to somebody who doesn't have a step two score above this certain benchmark, or I won't offer a, a residency position. I won't rank uh, a student uh, f for the match if they, they don't meet this certain benchmark for step two. So step two is important. Uh, the average step two score is considerably higher than the average step one score. And I'm not sure why that is, if, uh, if it's just because the material is more clinical and, and students are more excited about, you know, talking about actual patients than about weird biochemistry and weird vague anatomy stuff that, uh, you know, but, but for whatever reason, the, the average USMLE Step 2 CK score is much higher than the average Step 1 score. But that score is definitely important. And, uh, you know, most places, uh, most medical schools won't let you graduate if you don't pass both Step 1 and Step 2. So, there, you know, there is certainly pressure to, to do well. Yeah, and I, I was one of those that did much better on Step 2. Step 1 was, was kind of my, my big uh, speed bump in, in medical <laughs> school because I, I was frustrated. I, I was more of the mindset of I want to take care of patients. I want to learn how to, how to treat patients. And I, I didn't go to a systems-based uh, school, which I think I would have done much better at. So it was more sit down and memorize microbiology, sit down and memorize pathology, sit down and memorize pharmacology. It was all separated, and, and that frustrated me. And I did poor on step one. And then step two rolls around, and it was more integration and patient care, and I, I did much, much better. So I, I think that might be part of it. It's uh, y you're kind of the first two years of medical school just kind of hits you like a rock and you're, you're frustrated and, and a little down. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think that's not quite a universal finding, but it's, it's pretty close to a universal finding that students, almost everybody does better on step two than step one um, because it is. It's what they're excited about learning. Yeah. It's what you went to medical schools to do. Yep. Hopefully. Right. <laughs> oh, well, and, but, you know, not everybody does. There are people who, you know, say, well, I'm going to go into research. Uh, I'm going to get an MD, PhD, and, and I'm going to do research. And, and there are students who just don't, don't flourish in the clinical environment. But the vast majority of students do. And that's, you know, again, that's what people go to medical school for. I've yeah. always sort of viewed medical school as a, as a very high-end trade school, you know, like like being an auto mechanic, you got to learn how the the engine runs. You got to learn how to take it apart and put it back together. Well, that's what medical school is. You know, it's a it's a school. It's a trade school designed to create physicians, and that's that's yeah. it does a good job of that. Yes, it does. All right. So, step two. Yes, it's important for residency, uh, and then step three. Step three, you take after you graduate medical school, right? Correct. Step three is taken uh, usually um, after the, the intern year, uh, which is the first year of residency training. Uh, it kind of depends on, uh, you know, some, some residency programs require their interns to, to pass step three before they go on uh, into their, their second or third year of, of residency. Um, that is not a universal truth. My, my residency program didn't really care as long as you passed step three before you graduated from residency. But again, you cannot get a medical license until you are until you've passed all all three steps. Um, That's a, then, a full medical license, right? Yeah, a, a full medical license. You get you yeah. get a I can't remember what it's called a training license or something like that, uh, just to be able to see patients. Um, as a resident, but then to have a, a, a license to practice medicine independently, um, you have to have passed uh, all three steps, or you know, if you want to count step two as two two steps, you have to pass all the the, the steps of USMLE. Because you're taking it after your internship, you've you've done you know lots and lots of work taking care of patients, and you do most. I think most interns come out of internship feeling like they can do anything because you know you've you've been through the grind of, of of being an intern and working really really hard 
uh, for an entire year and, and you feel like, you know, I, I, I am competent. And so, you know, you, you don't spend as much time and energy worrying about uh, step step three. And, and it does kind of depend. Uh, if you're a, for instance, if you're a surgical resident and you have finished, um, you know, you're, you've done four or five years of surgery residency, and, and then you go to take step three. Step three mostly covers basic general medical conditions, which would be sort of internal medicine, th- and then a little bit of obstetrics, a little bit of surgery, a little bit of pediatrics. Um, but if if you've done nothing but surgery, you're really familiar with taking care of surgical patients, but maybe you haven't taken care of a lot of uh, patients with general medical conditions like heart attacks or, I don't know, runny noses or pneumonia or those sorts of things, um, you could very well feel uncomfortable, you know, being tested on some of those things because you haven't been doing that. So there, that's another reason that a lot of uh, a lot of residents will take step three as soon as they finish their intern year uh, so that that stuff is as fresh in their mind as it's ever going to be before they go on and, and specialize further. Let's talk about some of the studying and some of what you're doing with doctors in training and, and how and, and what kind of options doctors in training has for the student that is looking to start studying for step one and step two. Okay. Well, um, the there are lots of different ways to study for step one. And as I said, most students will, will spend um, somewhere in the in the vicinity of a month to two months of dedicated study time, sort of the end of their first year. Um, you know, they, they finish up, they take final exams sometimes in, end of April or early May, something like that. And then they have dedicated study time. And maybe their, their third year rotations are going to start uh, June 15th or July 1st was the traditional date uh, for starting third year. And, and so, uh, you know, you've got time from the end of you know, April, basically, when you take your, your finals at the end of your second year of medical school until, say, July 1st, when you're going to start third year, you've got all that time to, number one, study, <clears throat> and number two, take and hopefully pass step one. Um, and so most students will say, well, I want to take it in the middle of June so that I can have a little bit of time to, to sort of relax and unwind. And so that gives me basically all of May and the first week or week and a half, two weeks of June to study for this thing. Um, and that's sort of the, what I call the, the intensive study period. It's not really cramming because you cannot cram for these tests. There's simply too much material to really, you know, do an old fashioned overnight. I'm just going to cram what I have to learn. Um, but, uh, you know, you have this intensive study period of, of four weeks, six weeks, something along those lines. Um, a lot of students will actually begin studying on some level for step one much earlier in their second year, often around January, some students even in the fall of their second year. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of different study products out there. Um, a lot of students use electronic question banks. Um, a, a lot of students use one of diff- various uh, review books. There's a, a review book that's uh, very, very popular called First Aid for the USMLE Step 1. Uh, and, you know, that's been considered sort of the Bible for studying for Step 1 uh, for a long, long time, certainly as long as I've, you know, been in medicine. When I was a medical student and I, I took Step 1, um, I guess in the spring of 1998, um, you know, that was, uh, first aid was considered the Bible for studying for step one even back then. Um, and it's funny, you know, how, how thicker and thicker that book has become over the past 15 years. But at any rate, um, you know, there's you, you take you take a book, a review book, or maybe several review books. And the nice thing about first aid, it sort of covers everything. But there are individual step one review books for gross anatomy and microbiology and immunology and all the different ologies that you're going to be tested on. And and so some students will get uh, all these books and and read through them and and annotate them. And a lot of students will sort of get one early on. And as they're going through their second year classes, they will they will make sure that they highlight what's in 
first aid or whatever review book and make sure that they know that material and, and make notes in that material and, and add little pieces to it. You know, most of those review books are very very bullet point oriented. They, they, they boil things down to what are the, the 10 facts for this disease that you have to know. And so they can, you know, very, they, if you know just those, those 10 facts, you're in pretty good shape, but there's a lot of little connections, a lot of subtleties. And so a lot of students will spend a lot of their second year sort of annotating that book a little bit at a time. Uh, they'll, they'll purchase one of these, you know, big question banks with, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 questions, uh, you know, USMLE style, multiple choice questions that are electronic that they can work through. And, and they'll work through those questions a little bit uh, at a time, maybe once a week, they'll sit down for a couple of hours and they'll do a block of 40 questions. And then they'll spend, you know, spend an hour, 45 minutes or whatever, doing a block of 40 questions. And then you spend uh, you know, another hour, so going through those and looking at the explanations and, and looking, reading up on that and saying, well, I don't know about that disease. I need to look that up. Or I got this wrong and I really think I knew that disease pretty well. What was the detail that I overlooked? And that does two things. Number one, it, it helps solidify that knowledge so that you really understand what it is uh, that's being tested and, and getting those details. But number two, it gives you uh, invaluable practice in just taking the multiple choice part, just, just thinking about a multiple choice test as you should, you know, and, and uh, as I said before, it, we've been, we've all been taking multiple choice tests since we were, you know, in, in middle school or even earlier, but the, the fact is, you know, this is a test that is, that is timed, that you're doing a ton of questions in a, in a very short amount of time, you know, you might have a block of 40, I don't remember how big the blocks are now, 46 questions or something like that, and you might have 50 minutes to get through it. Well, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that that's about a minute per question. And, and some of these questions are, you know, a paragraph. Uh, and so you've got to read this material quickly. You don't have a lot of time to, to really go slowly and think and ponder. You've got to sort of be able to skim through it, get what they're asking about, dredge up whatever the, the answer should be out of memory, and then and, and, and move on. Um, and so it's really good practice to go through the, the question banks. And, and what I'm seeing is that students use question banks more and more and more. And so if, if you sort of think of studying for step one as sort of a, a, a stool with three legs, one of the stools is, is, is a review text or a group of review texts. Um, one, of the stool, one of the legs of the stool is a uh, question bank. And then I think the third leg of the stool uh, is is some sort of, is what we do, is which is you know, video-based uh, lectures um, on, on this material. Um, and, and what I think we really do nicely is we can, um, we can explain some of those bullet points and, and help students make the connections between the bullet points and fill in the gaps um, and, and also fill in, uh, you know, sort of the, 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 make the connections between um, this disease over here in, in uh, gynecology and this other disease over here in cardiology and, and see, okay, remember when we talked about this in cardiology? Well, it's the same kind of principle applies over here in, in gynecology. And so, you know, we have basically a series of about, about 75 hours of, of lecture on video associated with uh, a study guide with a ton of questions, and we, and we go through literally page by page, and we kind of explain and talk about diseases, and we, uh, we show what this looks like microscopically. We show, you know, what this looks like uh, grossly, and, and we uh, help to make those connections and help students really understand and, and to kind of bridge the gap, because a lot of students have a hard time driving through a 600-page review book, you know, and that's approximately what a book like First Aid is. It's, it's five or six hundred pages. And like I said, it's a lot of bullet points and a lot of dense material. And that's difficult for any student. Uh, it would certainly be difficult for me. Um, and so, you know, having somebody kind of walk you through it and say, this point is really important, uh, can be very helpful to a lot of students. Um, so it's, it's, that, not like, it's not like you're, if, if I'm a student and I purchase this, it's not like I'm buying the first two years of medical school over again where I have to sit there and listen to lectures. It's it's a little bit more pointed towards the USMLE and the type of 
questions they're going to ask and the type of information that I'm going to need to know. Absolutely. I mean, we, we assume that this is a review. I mean, it's it's called, we call it the, uh, the USMLE Step 1 review course. I mean, it's not teaching this material over. Uh, you couldn't, uh, you know, skip the first two years of medical school, sleep through class, and, and you know, just just grab our course and say, well, I'm going to pass this test. I mean, it's really building upon a solid foundation. And we tell students, what's the number one most important thing you should do during your second year to prepare for medical or for the step one exam is to do well in your second year courses. Make sure you're learning the pharmacology and the pathology as well as you can. Because, you know, as, I, as I'm teaching the step one course, I'm, I'm hoping to remind students of material that they've already learned, that's already in their brain somewhere. They've just sort of not been using it, so they've forgotten about it. And we're trying to bring it back into into memory. You know, it's it's locked away down there somewhere in long term memory. I and mean, we're trying to sort of get it out of out of there and, and, and refresh the memory. And so it is a review. Um, and, and we do, you know, we talk about a lot of tricks about this is the kinds of things you're going to be seeing on the test. This is the way this kind of question is typically asked. Um, this is, you know, something you might watch out for so you don't get tripped up and tricked. Um, you know, we've had, I don't know, 11, 12 years of experience, and so we've gotten a lot of feedback from students over the years about, you know, this this is a topic that's really stressed on step one. This is a topic that uh, I never saw, and so we, we can sort of tailor the course to what kinds of topics students are telling us that they're seeing on the exam. Okay. And then our step two course is, is kind of the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit shorter. Um, it's, uh, it's, again, more clinically focused, and it's really designed to, uh, you know, help students review that material. And, again, I, I think in a way it's, it's as important for step two because, you know, you, you don't have – for step two, you're taking it at, usually at the beginning of your fourth year. You don't have this dedicated six weeks of study time. Um, most students are, you know, maybe they can take off a month and and prepare for the exam, but most students don't even have that luxury. They're trying to uh, do sub-internships. They're doing fourth-year electives, uh, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what they want to do. Uh, you know, you, you only get, you only have so much time as a fourth-year student to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life. Uh, you know, you've got to sort of make a decision. This is what I want to specialize in. And so, um, most students don't do a, a an ophthalmology rotation or a radiology rotation during their third year. And so if you want to go into ophthalmology or radiology, well, in the first couple of months of, of fourth year, you need to get some exposure to that and, and try that out and make sure it's really something you want to do. Um, so a lot of students during that first part of fourth year when they're, you know, theoretically are, are studying for step, uh, step two, uh, they are also in the hospital seeing patients, and so they're working very hard as a fourth-year student. So students don't have that big, dedicated six-week chunk of time to study for step two. And as a third-year student, you know, you do, say, six weeks or two months of obstetrics and, and another two months of uh, surgery and then two months of psychiatry and then, uh, you know, maybe three or four months of internal medicine then two months of pediatrics. And, and then you sit down and take your step two exam. Well, it may be that according to your schedule, it's been eight or nine months or even a whole year since you did any obstetrics. And, you know, that stuff is, there's a lot of detail. I, I pick on obstetrics. I like obstetrics. Um, uh, but there's a lot of detail there in, in obstetrics that you don't really use any, anywhere else in medicine. Um, and so, you know, if you were to try to go in and take your step two exam without any real preparation, I guarantee you'd have a hard time with those, those topics that you haven't seen for six, nine, 12 months. And so, you know, our course is designed to, again, bring that stuff out of memory. You learned this when you were doing your obstetric rotation, but it's been nine months. So let's go through this, you know, over the course of a few hours and review all this material so that it's fresh in your mind. Again, you're not learning something for the first time. You're simply reviewing it uh, extensively and carefully in a focused way so that when you sit down to take the test, uh, you know, it's, it's there in your short-term memory where you need it to be. All right, folks, that was Dr. Mike McGinnis. I think looking back on my studying, I probably would have benefited very much from taking a course like 
doctors in training offers with their their step one board review. And I, I did something similar for step two. It was with a different company. But looking back at how I prepared, the question always comes up, what's the best preparation for the board exams? And the answer always is doing well in your core coursework in medical school. So I didn't do as well as I wanted to in the coursework because I was like, oh, I'll do well in the clinical years, not a problem. That's that's my strong suit. And I kind of ignored the uh, the rest. But looking back, I probably should have taken a prep course like this instead of just trying to study first aid um, by myself. So anyway, everything we talked about today, you can find in the show notes, medicalschoolhq.net slash session 28. And again, as I always like to say, the conversation with Dr. McInnes doesn't end here. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Dr. McInnes, D-I-T, and you spell that D-R-M-C-I-N-N-I-S-D-I-T. I'm at Medical School HQ. You can also go to the show notes and leave a comment there on the page, medicalschoolhq.net slash session 28, or shoot us an email at feedback at medicalschoolhq.net. As always, I hope you, the listener, got valuable information from today's episode. I hope you join us next time here at the Medical School Headquarters.